Good evening. Thank you for joining us for tonight's Inspiration webinar. Inspiration Software is the embroidery software line of G7 Solutions and Designs and Machine Embroidery. Our Inspiration Software line includes My Block Piecer, My Quilt Embellisher, My Perfect Embroidery Pro, and Perfect Stitch Viewer. Tonight's webinar features Our Perfect Embroidery Pro and Texting with Perfection. We have a wonderful team assisting us tonight, Dory, Manager of the Tech Support, with Nancy R. And I would like to introduce you to our longtime family member, Catherine Artinas. Catherine is the author of several books and many articles in designs and machine embroidery and loves to play with the Perfect Embroidery Pro. So with no further ado, digitize away, Catherine. Good evening. Tonight we learn and play with text. I'm a self-professed word nerd, so I'm excited. We begin with the digitized scalable fonts, which are those that you find under the text tool. Digitized scalable fonts, meaning the letters were all digitized individually with pull-push considered and to give you letters of all of the same height. Digitized scalable font as opposed to converted graphics, such as when we import true type text. In Tamara's webinar earlier this month, toward the end, she used the letter M, which was a converted graphic. Typed the letter in Word, saved it as a JPEG, and traced it in the software. We'll be playing with true type fonts in May. Let's understand some terms first. The word typeface indicates the design for a set of fonts, such as Arial, Arial Black, Arial Rounded. The word font defines characters in a specific design and size, such as Arial 12 and Arial 24 point. Those are two different fonts. Typeface is what you see, and font is what you use. If you think of this, there's different songs that make up a CD, well, different fonts make up the typeface. But in today's usage, experts agree we can use the word font to mean both the look and the choice. We have two buttons to choose from when we need letters. We have text and monogram. They have the prime spots, first and second buttons, on the toolbar extra. Um, and the reason for that is they're probably the ones that are used most often. Did you know that making personalized projects with lettering is the number one reason people buy home embroidery machines? We will begin with a text tool. Let's bring up a clean design screen and we'll click on the text tool. As I bring the mouse over to the screen, you see that the mouse itself has changed um, to a symbol A. If I go ahead and click on the screen, I automatically get the letter A, that is the default, and also, it will give it to me in the last font that was used. In this case, it's the Bauhaus. To create our text, we're going to click over in the text box, and I'll just type my word for the evening as we start tonight. My word, celebrate. I come over here and click on Apply. And I'm given the word on the screen. Uh, it looks a little different than what we're used to seeing when we have something selected. The box is certainly around it, but we have many other symbols that surround it. We have the double black arrows, the double blue arrows, the black diamond, black squares, green circles, and so forth. And all of those are for manual manipulation. We'll return to those a little bit later. Let's first play in the properties box. You see that the default height is 0.79 inches, which is just a hair over a three-quarter inch. We certainly can click up there and type in whatever size font we'd like. I'll type in the one and a half, and I apply that. Um, you notice that it makes it taller and wider, so be sure that when you set your height, it will still fit in the area uh, for your specific project. Keep in mind, too, that letters always look bigger once they are embroidered, so it's better to err on the side of being a little too small than a little too big. See how some of the letters are very close together? 
The distance between letters is referred to as kerning. It takes the name because a kern is the part of a letter that overhangs a text, um, the type block. You can see right here, this is not hanging over, and here we have just a, letter, a little area. That's called the kern, and it's generally the serifs of a type uh, the font that hangs over the block. If you take a look at over here, if the word serif is new to you, the serif is just a little projection at the ends and tops of letters in a certain font. It's marked here for you in red so you can see what those serifs are. Here is the text, the serif font, and right above it you have a sans serif font. Sans meaning without, so this means without serif. So we have um, Basically, the two types of fonts to choose from is a serif font and a sans serif font. <clears throat> when we look at our word, we see that the L, the R, and the T take up less space than the other letters. If you were to take your ruler over here and measure the C, the width of the C, the width of the E, and so forth, you would see that they are different widths. The reason for that is this is what's considered a proportional font, that the letters take up different spacing dependent on the, the style of the letter and, of course, the letter itself. If you go back to maybe your typewriting days, if you remember the Courier font, that was what was called a monospaced font. Every character took up the same uh, width as the next. A W would be the same width as the letter T. There's a whole world out there about typeface, font, kerning, etc. And you'll notice tonight that I give you a little bit of background sometimes at certain places to help you understand the why of letters. We can apply kerning either to the entire word at once or to individual letters. If we come over over here into the properties. The kerning in Perfect Embroidery Pro is indicated by space percentage, currently set at zero. If I type a 5 in there for percentage and apply it, I see that an, uh, a bit of white space has been added between the characters. If I come over here and put in 10% and apply that, obviously we're going to see more white space in between all the all of the letters, and again, that's what's happening. The same amount of white space or kerning is being added to all the letters in the word. I'm going to come back there and put zero back in to put it back the way it was. You also notice that as you kern, it, the letter or the uh, word itself is going to be longer. But there might be a place where we don't necessarily need to add the kerning all the way across to the word. So we have the option to do so manually. If I put my mouse on that double-headed blue arrow in front of the L and move towards the right, you saw from that position all the way to the rest of the word moved over the amount of space that I did the drag. I can do that here and there if I want a little bit extra space between some of those thin letters. And in doing so now, I seem to have some uneven white space, so I might want to rest on this black diamond. The black diamond is what's going to allow me to manipulate just that character, and I can drag it over just a little bit. I can do that with the R. The R looks pretty good, so I only have to drag that over a hair. And again, if I get my mouse on that black diamond, see the difference? Here I'm not on it. Here I am. I have my four-headed arrow, and I can drag that lettering over. So yes, we can do it all uh, at once to the word, or we can go in and specifically kern the individual letters. When I grabbed that um, black diamond, you may have noticed that all my blue arrows went away. All I have to do is click right back on that letter, and there they are again, allowing me to move over the characters if I see fit. So not to worry. Let's change the font. Up here on my screen, I have uh, Bauhaus is the current font chosen. And when I rest on that font window, you see a box comes up that shows all the available characters for that font, as well as numbers and um, symbols, punctuation marks, diacritics, all of the things that are available in that particular font. If I use my dropdown, let me get my thing out of my way here for a moment. If I use my dropdown, you can see scroll through all 240 fonts that are available for us in Perfect Embroidery Pro. You'll also notice that we have some lettering in front of it. The red 
capital F indicates that that is a keyboard font. Uh, some of you might remember in the uh, earlier days of printing and we would do a drop down for our true type fonts, we would see a TT in front of some of the fonts to indicate true type. Well, this F is indicating for us that this is a keyboard font. If we scroll down towards the bottom, we see a capital M in green that's going to indicate the monogrammed fonts that are built in. And then we have a gold lowercase m indicating many fonts. Now these many fonts um, were specifically digitized for extra small lettering. And I mean small, as in 3 millimeter, 4 millimeter, 6 millimeter. I have a, a design created for you here to show you the differences. I already have it up on the screen so you can see. If we were talking about Arial, this is the default 20 millimeter um, size for the Arial. If I were to take the small at 6 millimeter, small at 4 millimeter, and small at 3 millimeter, you see the difference here. Um, quite a difference with this really small 3 millimeter font. But the neat thing about these is they were specifically designed to stitch out that small. Um, you need to bring logic to your project though. Even though we have these small fonts that we can use to embroider, you still have to bring logic to the project in that be aware of what type of fabric you're trying to do this very small embroidery on, what kind of stabilizer are you using. You certainly want to use a number nine needle and um, most probably a 60 weight lightweight thread so that everything comes out as you intend it to come out. <clears throat> we look back at our Celebrate and we talk about changing the font. I certainly can click on this drop down arrow and I see my font up there in the window. I could, as I did just a moment ago, drag down with my mouse and make a selection. But realize that you can also, right now you see my mouse um, whoops, I'll move that down a little bit. But right now, I am using the down arrow on my keyboard, and you see that I am moving through those choices for the fonts. If I come down to cursive is what I'm after, um, on the keyboard, I am hitting my Enter key, and that applied the cursive font to my word Celebrate. You'll see differences, obviously, because cursive itself, the font itself, remember we talked about the font um, being the design as well as the size. You can see both of those, those things have happened with the cursive. If I use my dropdown and I go and play with Farfel and apply it, you see an uh-oh, what's happened on my screen? Well, let's take a look up here at the font box. We have an indication here. Remember, we can rest on that. And in the available characters, we see that all we are offered is all caps, no lowercase. So it could not finish the word celebrate for us. Um, we can also tell that because there's no lower, uh, lowercase letters up in the box. So if I come back instead from Farvel to maybe a Ross and apply that, you see that all my characters are back into place. We come back over to properties. Um, you probably have already played with this one, but just to make sure, if you click in the box for stairs and apply, you see that it does a very fun stair step to your characters. Uh, this will only happen if you have a one line of text. We can take the stairs out and apply this straight again. I'm going to come up here and change the size to 1.5 once again and apply that. And as I do, obviously, uh, we see that the word itself has gotten larger, an inch and a half tall. But what I want to show you here is the um, inconsistency in the satin stitch. The default for your text is satin. Um, satin is usually the prettier stitch, it's a more traditional stitch, but we have some limitation, if you will, when we use satin. And here's one of them. We have a full satin here, but then you see that you have a split satin in a lot of the other areas of the characters. You still have some satin here and there, but very much a split satin. And the reason for that can be found under our column page. We're interested now in this lower area of our um, properties box where it talks about split satin type. Currently it's set to random, that is the default, and that's exactly what we're seeing here on our screen. It is random where we have a straight satin and a split satin. 
one of the, the important rules here that's in this box is this one right here where it says deactivate splitting if length in millimeter is less than, there's some algebra tonight, is less than 7 millimeter. That means that it will no longer split if that length is less than 7. Well, with a random split set at 7, it is going to split. Um, 7 millimeter is the industry recommendation for the greatest length of a satin stitch. Most uh, home embroidery machines have a maximum stitch length from 9 to 12 millimeter for a single stitch. And what that means is how far the X and Y axis can be moved in the pentagram from the last stitch. This is where the stitch was. How far in millimeter can it move? And it depends on the machine itself. Um, just because you can stitch in a satin stitch that's 7 or above doesn't mean you want to. Let me show you what I'm talking about. If we go under our split satin and we say none, in other words, do not split the satin. Here we have a beautiful word, all done in a very rich satin stitch, but if we were to take our ruler and let me uh, change the over to metric and I take my ruler into any one of these characters, I can see right there that that satin is 8.2. If I try it on my B and use my ruler, that satin is 8. If I come here in my arc of my A, it's 7.3. So very much of this satin stitch is indeed over our rule of the seven point because this none is taking precedence in allowing all that satin to happen. If I were to use my drop down and say percentage, this is a percentage of the size, default is 30. If I apply that, you'll see what happens here. Yes, I still have some inconsistency of the satin stitch, but instead of just a almost like a single split, I have a double split that's going on in all of these characters. I can increase that percentage to a 50 and apply it, and that does something even different. I have a definite double um, sinking of the needle. The needle is going to sink two times across that area for the satin. So that's really not what I want either. I'll put that back to the default. But if I come here and say absolute, my absolute distance, the absolute split distance default is 2 millimeter. If I apply that, once again I see our, our uh, indecision here with satin because the inconsistency is still there. If I increase that absolute, and absolute means there is no fluctuation, there's no less than, greater than, absolute means it equals this and nothing else. So if I increase that absolute to say 5 and apply it, looking for whatever magic number is going to give me that pretty satin but still work, that did not work for us. I've typed in a 6 and try that, and it's better, but I still have some rough area in there. Well, the thought is, if I put in my 7 and apply it, at first glance it might look okay, but at a closer glance, I see I really do have some double needle penetration in some of these areas. And to think about it, I do not want to go greater than 7 because we know the rule is the satin should be no uh, wider than 7. And the reason for that is because it um, snags and the stitching can become part of a problem or wear inconsistently and so forth. Bottom line, you, once again, we know that we can put that to none and we have a beautiful satin stitch all across the board, but you have to make that decision. You have to decide what is right for the project. If this is a wall hanging or a frame, uh, framed um, embroidery, then maybe the longer stitch you can get away with that and it would be very lovely. But if this is going to be on something for a baby or require multiple washings, you don't want to go bigger than that. Um, 7 millimeter, and you probably want to go smaller for a tight situation. So let's put this back to random, because in our situation with a one and a half inch size font, um, none of these satins are going to work. So we're left with the idea of what to do. Well, one of the options certainly is we could come back here and make this a smaller letter, or you can go into your fill type and instead of having it be a satin fill, you can choose a fun fill, such as uh, this brick. 
I happen to like this look. Um, it's a little bit more modern, puts a little bit more playful feeling to your project, and plus it allows you to keep with a much larger font. I have a project that actually uses this. I'll show you very quickly here a picture. This is this letter here is a little over three inches high, and I use the fun. Uh, whoops, too big for you. I use the fun. Uh, fill, and you can see what it looks like at that point. And I like it for the entire project because it allowed me to do a lot of bigger characters. So that is an option. Um, oops, let's close that one out. We're finished with that idea. This is an option, and if we go back in, there's a couple other ones that I think are kind of fun. The zigzag works, and so does the corn. So uh, again, you have an option. If you absolutely want satin, then we would have to go with a smaller size. If you want the larger size, then you might think to bring in some of your fill pattern. All right, as we go to one of our other properties, we'll come over here to our commands. And here we want to take a look at color. We have two areas here that um, talk to us about color. The first one is this one here, telling us color number one. And then we have a color change towards the bottom. And sometimes if someone is new to the software, they think that this color means how many colors I would be allowed to have in my word. Well, if I up that to what I think is four and I apply it, what has actually happened is it has come down here into our uh, thread chart down here and chosen color number four. If I come back up here and put it back to one and apply it, you'll see that it puts everything back to color number one, which is blue. So that's just a, a precise way for you to pick a certain color. Um, if, in, on the other hand, we come down to our color change, this is usually what people are after, is to be able to change the individual characters. Because right now, this is one full text box. Whatever we do to the box affects all of the characters inside. So we could not individually choose our colors for the characters. This is the way that you want to do it. Come under color change, use your drop down, say characters, and apply. And this generally is what we're after, is to give our word individual color stops. Also, you can see that it changed automatically the trim. It is going to trim after every character. We only have one word up there, but you see that you could also apply colors to words or separate lines and so forth. So we'll leave it at characters. Um, if we take that manual manual manipulation one step further, we can see, remember that we want the mouse on the black diamond. If I click, that one letter itself is selected. I can actually resize that character. If I click here, I can actually rotate the character and move it over a little bit. Uh, bring up the L, play with the E, rotate it maybe in the opposite way, uh, maybe make that a little smaller put my E where I want it to, bring my B up, <clears throat> rotate that, bring my R, and you see that you can go in and you can make the word look whatever way you'd like it to, and what we're doing, because I've used the word celebrate, I am trying to get the color and the characters themselves to give the feeling of the word celebrate. So you can have a lot of fun playing with the individual characters, um, getting a custom look for yourself, and have fun with it. So you see that we then have made the word give the feeling of a celebration. We're going to open up another um, document that I already have, actually a design page that I've already created, so you didn't have to sit and watch, watch me type. And we see here that in this case, I have created a text box that has multiple lines to it. Celebrate was only one word, so we couldn't play with all of the properties. But here that I have three lines of text, we can do some other things to it. You also notice that I do have all caps in the second line. Uh, because of the font that's chosen, I've chosen the hobo, they are very close together. So the first thing I probably would want to do is to change my spacing. I'll put that at 10%. 
that will spread that out a little bit, helping us to read it. Um, certainly, you want to make it as easy for your reader to read your text, your message. Um, that's the whole purpose behind typing text, is so that the uh, user or reader can read your message. So we want to make it as easy for them to do that as possible. The other thing we want to address is um, the idea of what is called line spacing here in Perfect Embroidery Pro and in the printing world is referred to as letting. It's the amount of white space that um, shows up between your lines of text. It is this white space right in here between the rows. At first glance, it might look to you that this is uneven. Um, the amount of white space here looks less than the amount of white space that we have here. But really, what we want to compare is the tops of the letters. These are called ascenders. Any of your letters like B's and D's and T's and L's and H's, they all have ascenders. So that amount of line spacing will be measured from the topmost um, letter to the bottom of the row ahead of it and so forth. The reason this is uh, technically called letting. Back in the typeset days when they were putting in their blocks of type, they would use bars of lead in between their rows of text to have no printing in that area. So the amount of bars that they put in, the number of letting bars that they put in indicated the letting. So that's where that term came from. Um, we can come over here to line spacing and change that 25% to 50% and apply it. And you see that, indeed, that did increase the amount of white space here. We could go farther with that at 75. Again, it makes it easier to read, but you always have to think about how large is the area on your project that's going to accept all of this text. We come over to some other properties now that we have multiple lines. We see this property here called Align. The text is currently centered. If I click on the left and apply, it is going to give left justification to these lines of text. And then, obviously, if I click on right and apply, it will come over and do right justification. Now, in doing that, you can see uh, something that I did that I probably didn't want to do. See this white space here? My word the does not come all the way over to the right margin. That's because up in the text when I was typing, I probably automatically put a space in between the word the and what I thought I was going to keep typing was leprechauns and then went back and just hit my enter. So if on my keyboard I hit my delete key, I have removed that space, apply it now, you see that the text itself is right justified. I'm going to put it back to center, and we will talk about um, the start at. <clears throat> this says start at left. This is talking about the order in which the um, text will embroider, Okay, the actual way it will stitch. might be something you never even thought about before, because most of the time you allow the stitching to happen from left to right, because, of course, that's how we read. But we have options here. We could start it at the right, or we could start it at the center. I'm going to leave it on center. And the reason you might want to do that is if you have a very long line of text, um, this start at center helps to tame the pull on the fabric. Watch what happens when I do the slow redraw, and I'm just going to draw it across for you. Do you see how it started in the middle of leprechauns, and it started in made me do it. So it actually is stitching from the center out on those lines of text. And again, the reason to do that might be um, if you need to help with the pull on your fabric. All right. If I then come to my other two boxes of text, the Fluent Blarney, if I click on this one, oops, um, put that back. And if I click on this one, you can see that this is one full block of text where I typed the um, separate lines, use my enter key. If I come over here, I can see that it's the same uh, um, 
phrase, but I have typed it in three different boxes. There will be times that you might want to use this trick so all of your text is in one box. If I'm over here, I know that I have to apply the same font to all of the words in this text box. There's no way around that. The one font applies to all. And I do have capital letters in here. So if I were going to apply the cursive font to all of this, the word Blarney would be almost impossible to read, as I have typed it for you down here. Um, you want to be very careful in typing all caps in anything that is a cursive or a script font. It is just difficult to read, and you don't want to do that to your users. Um, instead, so that I can keep the top and bottom portion in the same font cursive, I have three different boxes, and that way I can then keep the word Blarney, which I know that I want to do in all caps, I have given um, a monospaced font uh, capital that has no lowercase letters to it. And it also allowed me to change the color of that word as well. So there's a trick for you sometimes if you're trying to um, have a little differences in your text, you can do a couple different boxes. The other thing I can do here is sometimes if you really need to squeeze your text as close together, you want it as big as possible, and your area is only a certain amount, you can play with the amount of line spacing um, by manually dragging your boxes into place. Here I've dragged this up, and you can see that my ascender for the K is taking advantage of that white area in the A, but not so good over here on my H. So let me go get my text tool, because do you notice right here, I have just selected this text with my normal select key, and I do not have those manual manipulation symbols that I need. So to do that, you come back to your text tool, click on that, and then it gives me those symbols. I can rest right on my blue and bring that word here over just a little bit and sort of tuck it up into my white space for the end. Now, this is not ideal, but I wanted to show you that trick there that, yes, you have more control over placement if, indeed, you go to uh, multiple boxes instead of just the one. And once again, before we leave this screen, I'm going to uh, really caution you about ever using all caps with script or cursive, um, whether you're embroidering or <laughs> typing. We'll open another screen that I have for us. And here, I want to talk a little bit about um, the shaping, the shaping tool that we have built into Perfect Embroidery Pro. And it was uh, this phrase right here, th these two phrases are the same phrase. One is typed in all caps, and the other is typed in upper lower case. And this is to show you once again, you have ascenders with the K and the F and the T and the H, and then we also have a descender with the Y. So we have area of the text that goes above and below. When we are working with shape, let me get my text selection tool, click on my phrase, and my symbols will become available for me. We have not yet played with these uh, black squares that are at the end. You can rest your mouse on them and play with them. And once again, I would strongly encourage you to play. Don't ever be afraid of anything. You know you have the undo key. If you don't know what something does, you simply play with it. I see no reason to memorize what all of these symbols mean. You just get in there and you just start to play. But you see that I have increased the height at um, the right end of this. It sort of looks like a megaphone. If I put that back, uh, I could do the same with my text here. If I drag here in the middle and drag up, again, playing with the different symbols and, see, and so forth, just to see what they do for you. It's, it's fun to see what it does. But let me show you what I'm after. We have the ability to right-click, come down to Envelope, and you see all of these shapes that are already built in for us that we could, instead of trying to drag ourselves, we could go and have it create. I'm going to use the double concave bridge, and that applies. And while I'm still here, I'm going to apply it to this as well, Envelope, double concave bridge. I'm going to get my normal select tool and select each one of them 
and really um, exaggerate the shape of each of these. Remember, each of these have the same envelope shape to them. And what I want to point out to you here is when you are playing with your shapes, first of all, it's very fun to do that. You see where you go to get them. But look at the uh, phrase that's done in all caps. Do you see because all of the letters are the same height um, at the top, also at the bottom, although they will always be at the bottom, um, but at the top and the bottom, that your shape for that bridge is absolutely defined all the way throughout that phrase. If we were to look down here at the upper lowercase phrase, you see that it is not as strong to hold that shape because the letters themselves, all of them are not all there up at the top. They are not all there at the bottom because of the Y. Um, I'm just going to show you very quickly when you work with your shapes, your better option is your all caps. Okay. We have another tool that's quite fun, and it is our path tool. Oops, let's go the other way here, and we're going to play with our path uh, to start with. And once again, I have some things that are already typed on your screen. With the path, we see this one, the orange one, that actually has the meandering feeling of the phrase itself, a walk through the woods among the flowers. We do that by <clears throat> coming over here in our properties, and this property right here called type is set to path. If I were to change this one and I select my text, it is now normal. I come over, right click, and apply the path. I can see that I have um, a number of different, uh, all my symbols that I'm used to seeing, but I also see that sort of hot pink path line that's there. I'm going to right click on that path, come down to edit baseline. And as I click there, please notice that here I have a point, and then I actually have two points, one under the F and one under the S. I want to add the same feeling, the same little arc to the phrase. So I'm going to bring my mouse and right click on the pink line, add point. I'm going to right click and add point. And now I can click on that path and drag it up. And maybe with this one, I drag it down. I'll bring this one down a little bit more. And this is not a smooth round point. So if I right click on that and ask it to be smooth, you might think that you want to come over here and hit the Apply button as we normally would for anything. But in this case, you actually click on the, word, the letters themselves, on any of them, and that will apply the path to our text. If I take off that text selection, I can see that, indeed, I have the same feeling to that text. You want to be careful when you do edges and so forth that you don't make an arc that is so tight. Let me pick that again, come and edit the baseline. If I were to make that arc so tight and then apply it that your letters themselves start to stack up on each other like that. Okay, you want to avoid that if you can. Well, I'll just flat out and say you want to avoid that. So we'll go ahead and do an uh, undo to get our, oops, not so far. We want a, our pretty path. Here's another example of a path. If I get my text selection tool and click on that, I can see that I do have my baseline. I'm going to right click, edit baseline. If you've never used the guidelines that are built in the ruler, I love these. I use them all the time. All you need to do is come up here. I have my mouse resting up there and I just click and drag a horizontal line down here. I also want to come over to the left and click and drag from the ruler and bring a guideline over because I'd really like to straighten up this area that I have for my text. Let's use our magnifier and zoom in just a little bit and I'm going to get my points and drag that right over to my vertical guideline I've put in. I can drag that down to my horizontal, and I know that's straighter. I click on one of my letters, and it will adjust, and now I have uh, more of a falling in love feeling. 
If you are using those guidelines, uh, once you are finished, you simply come over to the ruler, right click, remove guidelines, and they are gone. I love them. I use them a lot. So there is our path tool. We also have another fun tool, and it is the circle tool. I'm going to click on my text. I click anywhere on my screen. I'm going to come up into my text box and type the phrase that I'd like. Once again, I'm going to come down here to type and click on my drop down and ask for a circle and apply it. And when I do that, you see that Kiss Me has been applied in an arc, um, evenly spaced, and my height for my character is still my point seventy nine. We have a couple things uh, to be aware of when we type with our circle. First of all, I'm going to direct your attention to down here. I can't go there for the moment because down at the bottom left of your status bar, do you see where it reads, my radius is 2.05. If I actually bring my mouse down in there, it disappears. So I click back in my circle and see it again. But the radius is 2.05. A little math review for all of us. The radius is the distance from the center to the side of the inside circle. All right, From the center to the side of the inside circle. The diameter would be the full length from side to side. In other words, the diameter is twice the radius. If we take a look, we have lots of other symbols in our circle as well. Once again, I would encourage you to play. If I click on that center pink one and drag down, do you see that I am changing the radius? That inner circle is smaller. The characters themselves um, spread out, but the character is the same size as it was. So it's just making a tighter arc, um, a smaller radius. It's now a little over one inch. I'll go ahead and put that back where it was. And if I rest on my goal circle and drag that down, you can see that the radius is staying the same, but my characters are getting smaller. Notice the height over here is 0.33, and the uh, outer circle is also getting smaller to fit the height of the characters. If I come over here to this gold circle and click and drag, you can see that this circle allows me to spread out the characters. They are no longer the, um, in a, a proportion uh, as they were before. We have more white space between them and so forth. If we undo that, and then our final circle to play with is if we click on that and drag in, you see that it is no longer a perfect circle, but is moving towards an oval. So all of those are available to you. The question comes up frequently. Um, what if I want my text not at the top of the circle, but at the bottom? This is very easy to do. Coming over into your properties, we now have reverse direction. We put a check mark in that and apply it, and your text goes to the bottom of that circle. All your buttons would apply, your circles would apply in the same manner as when we were just playing with them. I'll go ahead and take that out and hit apply again, because another question that comes up frequently is, what if I want text typed up here at the top of the circle and also at the bottom of the circle? Well, the trick is to copy-paste your original circle. So I'm going to get my normal selection tool. Notice that the circle goes away because I no longer have my text selection. I want to do a right-click, copy, right-click, paste. I know that Kiss Me is right on top of Kiss Me, so with my second circle selected, I'll do my reverse direction and apply. I know it's odd for the moment, I have the same text, but let me come over here and type in the rest of my phrase. And apply that. You can see that we have two, uh, we, we actually have two circles, if I do my text selection, you can see that the top text is in the exact same circle as the bottom text. In reality, I have two different circles going on. But that's the trick if you want text to appear at the top of your circle and also at the bottom of your circle. We could top that off, of course, with the holidays coming. We could go into our applique shapes and drag down until we find our 
Shamrock, bring that in, whoops, size it, place it into the middle, turn it into green, and there you have something fun for next month. Okay, um, something else to show you while I ask if there are any well, can you Questions? answer? Can you answer, yes. Catherine, for us? Can you use the center start at four caps? At what, honey? I'm sorry, I didn't understand the question. Can I use the uh, and start at center for what? For caps, capital letters. Yes, you can. If you, if I go back to this screen where we were playing, in this box, here's all my caps right there, and if I start that slow redraw, let me just allow it to play on its own, and you'll see that it's going. it starts at the middle here, the lowercase t-h-e, but the next row, this next row that's going to start, these are capital letters, so it is doing the capitals from the center position out towards the left, and then it will come back from center position and stitch out to the right. So yes, it does not matter if it's uppercase or lowercase, all caps, um, whatever your letters are, if you apply that, that's how it will stitch. All right, and can a colon be used in text lines? Um, very good question. If we go up in, in here, just because I have multiple lines, and I come over into this box, and let's say we just wanted a colon right there after leprechauns, I can do my apply, and we see that it is used, but remember, that it is based on the font that you have chosen. Do you see that when I rest on Hobo, down in this area right here, it shows the punctuation marks that are available for that particular font. So it's not so much the punctuation mark that's controlling it, it is the font that you have chosen and whether or not that font supports the punctuation marks. Okay. Okay. And how and you can see yeah, go ahead. You can see right there, I changed to impact, and the impact, uh, the colon is still over here in my text box, but the colon is not showing here. That tells us that impact does not support the colon. Ah, very good. Do you have the ability to change the underlay for text? Yeah, you have it there. Um, if we come over to this, well, I say that confidently. Um, <laughs> yes, that's, that, that's the button I wanted. Uh, we come over here, you see that it is by default uh, chosen for the font. Again, I had Hobo, whether you have a different type of font chosen. You may notice different underlay, but yes, you have the option to change your different underlay um, as you determine would be necessary for your types of fabric and so forth. Okay, and last but not least, if you want the individual character different colors, how do you control the color assignment, and how can you use the same color more than once in a line? Okay, a little bit of trick here. Um, when we did that to our text, and we were over in our color, I purposely put it back to number one, Knowing that I had 10 characters in my text, you may notice that it automatically added colors 9 and 10, because by default it's going to give us eight, character, or, uh, 8 colors in our thread chart. So if we wanted to deal with that, I could change the colors in a rainbow effect or a random, not random, but I could change the colors. If I change the starting color, let's put that back to 4. Remember, 4 down here is my orange color. If I start it at 4 and then apply, notice that the first color starts at orange, which was my chosen color right here, and then it goes down the thread chart. Please notice that it also added more colors because I needed 10, and um, by starting at 4, I needed the three additional colors. So now I have changed the palette. If I want to change the individual color, um, I would need to come in here, and let's say we're not thrilled, well, let's say we're not thrilled with number 13, which is kind of a dull color for our word celebrate. I would need to uh, click, oops, 
click normally on the color that I want to change, and let's say I chose just a real bright yellow and OK it, it automatically will change that. But I would have to go in as I am reading orange, gold, green, uh, uh, darker gold, I would have to change the colors down here to be the colors that are going to represent. Remember, I cannot change, if I were to text select that, even though I'm allowed to select an individual character, I cannot control the color of this character by coming down here and making another choice for that. I have to work within the uh, confines of my commands with the starting color here, and then, of course, adding to the characters, and then changing that color down in the group for that particular character. I can't just select it here and think that I can come down normally and right-click on my color. OK. OK? Super. Thank you. That was easy. That was easy. And as I bring you back to the word fun, um, we're going to leave the text uh, for just a moment here. But this is to show you, this is the kind of thing that I love to do with text. You have all of this capability um, to make the words, your phrases that you're using, you can actually use the properties that are available to you. Some of you that were with me last month might remember we played with this jagged type on our heart. It's the same thing. We have the jagged applied to both edges at a two, and that gives us the feeling of being stressed out. Here with fishing, we have uh, one, two, uh, three, four, five text boxes that are here. But here with fishing, you see that envelope that we played with when we did the concave bridge. Um, here's another one that looks like the megaphone. This is a letter U that simply rotated. Letter U rotated upside down. You have the letters. O's. Over here in clock, you have different text boxes that allow you to um, achieve this, this look to it. And this circle, I love this font, this Arial Central Run. It's a very nice uh, single stitch font here with families. This is all done in one text box, just playing with the individual sizes of the characters. Jump is one box. Hang is one box. Yoga all one box, but notice for KISS, I actually did a second text box for the S so that we could mirror image that S to get that little smooching going on. And of course, um, you probably have seen other things similar to this. This is the number four that has been um, flipped, mirror, uh, mirrored, and then we have the letter U, and we have a number of different S's down here at the bottom with a script font that gives us the feeling of wave. So have fun with your text. Text are, is absolutely used to personalize things, but you can also have fun with your, your uh, characters themselves. OK, now we move to monograms. And when we do monograms, um, same, some of the same types of things that we are uh, used to doing um, come up here. And I see that I need to delete some things so I can show you how to do that. But we take a look first at our fonts um, that are in our monograms. I get the question often, what is the right way to create a monogram? Well, there are a number of rules for traditional monogramming, such as shown here in the pink. The surname. The initial for the surname or last name is usually in the center. The initial for the husband or male is on the left. And the initial for the wife or the female is on the right. This is a traditional monogram with the center character being larger. But today, there are many acceptable ways to create a monogram. Um, for example, this one, the same characters, the P, the K, and the A, are used in this lower example, but I put the K on the right side, which is the female, the P is, I'm sorry, the K is on the left side, the P is on the right side, and then the A is extended, larger, but it looks like um, they're all one, when in essence, they're really I haven't grouped at the moment, but if I ungroup them, you can see that they're really separate text boxes that are put together for more of an art look. So you have lots of options. When you create a monogram for someone else, whether it's a gift or in your business, you really want to think about the person you're creating it for. 
are they traditional or are they funky or a little bit more modern? If you need more information, you want to visit Eileen's blog and click on monograms or just Google monograms. Tons of suggestions. Um, those of you that love Pinterest know that you can go there and find all kinds of fun things. All right, I'm going to uh, change my font here. Um, we're, I'm going to show you two different ways to create a monogram. First thing we're going to do is go back to our text tool, and as I click on my text tool, the letter A comes up. I'm not happy with that font. I'm going to bring myself back to my uh, Bauhaus. I like this one a lot. And by the way, while I'm there, you might see that um, we have two fonts. You might think that those are the same, just one has an S in it. They're actually two, they're similar fonts, but they are different. The Bauhaus, without the S, has been digitized specifically to be smaller. And the Baus, with the S, the Baus house has been digitized to be um, a larger text. So they, you might think that they're the same, but they're not. There's another one that you'll also notice. It's Old English and Old English with it being abbreviated. Those are not the same either. So I'm going to choose this one and then apply that. And I bring that down and I'll go ahead and uh, change my color by right clicking on that. And if I come up in my text box and type those characters, Oops. and apply that. <clears throat> you can see that as we did when we played with the text, all of the letters are the same. I've typed them in all caps. They're all the same height. If I come over to my properties box, and here is my type, instead of allowing it to be normal, and I come down here and click on monogram and apply, it will automatically make the center letter taller and your left and right letter um, shorter, very much like this traditional monogram. And that's fine. If we come up here to the monogram tool, and I click on that, and I click down here, it will automatically put the um, center letter larger. Notice that it gives me the ABC. You might remember that on a uh, normal text, and I clicked, I only got the letter A, but now that I have chosen the monogram, it knows that we're going to be working with three characters, so it automatically fills in the ABC up here and makes that middle character larger. So you have two different ways to do that. Um, either way will get you a certain look. But as we have this one selected, we have the same uh, Bauhaus Font. I'm going to bring you back down. You may remember earlier that we saw all of these fonts that have the capital green. We know that these are monogrammed fonts. If I click on that and apply it to my second characters, what it is doing there is um, showing a shape. Most of your monograms will do this for you. They offer you a shape for the monogram itself. If I go back in here and pick the second one down and apply that, you see that has a different shape to it as well. So uh, very often that's going to be the difference between your monogram font. Now, for numerous times I've come over here and I've clicked on this drop down arrow to get the font that we are after. You may or may not know, but I happen to love this shortcut. If I come up here into the font window and click on that, it will bring me into the catalog of all of those 240 fonts. Now, I love this. As it, sewists and embroiderers and quilters, we are visual people. And yes, this window over here showed me the individual font chosen, but now I can see lots of them at a time. So if I know that I am looking for a script font or a um, sans serif font, I know that I can come here and I can just go through and look at these quickly running down my screen to find the one that I want. As I come down in the screen, I see all of these beautiful things I can choose from. But then towards the bottom, I now see the one that has been chosen. One of the thoughts that is different here in the catalog, you may remember that we saw the green M over here to indicate the monogram font. We do not see that green M over here. But what the catalog does for us is these are all in alphabetical order. We can see that Zaf 
stops the alphabetical order for the original fonts, and then here where the monogram fonts start, it starts again in alphabetical order, and quite honestly, you can see the shapes. You can see that these are all straight in the line, and you can see that these are in a shape themselves. So I could double click on my chosen um, font and it applies to the text as well. Something else that's different about a green marked monogram font. When we have chosen one of these, the other thing that becomes available to us is the decor. Um, by clicking on our drop down, we can come in here and apply that and see that decor applied. If I click over here, this is a plain font. I do not have any decor. So uh, all of the different fonts, if I come over here and click on this one, this also has, oops, I'm sorry, uh, if I go into decor, it has different decor, and I can apply that. And we see a very pretty traditional diamond applied to that font. If I come down here and apply it, one of the things that you have to be careful with decor is this is all one unit. Those uh, enders in this decor is part of the text. I cannot change the color of that ender separately. The only way that I can do it, this is still a monogram font, all my text properties apply. The only option I have is to come here and break up the text. Once I break up the text, I can change the color uh, ooh, I can change the color of those enders, but um, the font itself, these are no longer fonts, they are simple objects, and I have lost all of the properties for my no normal font. So if you absolutely want to change the colors in your decor, make sure that you do the breakup text at the very end when you know that you're happy with everything else. Thank you so much. Okay. You're very welcome. There's, um, there's a couple other fun things. Uh, real quick, I know I'm right at my, my hour top, but please go in and play with your monogram designs. You have many of your shields and so forth that are here. Feel free to uh, add those to your fonts as well. And you can size those. And then something else, just so you know that they are available to you, and then I'll uh, let everybody go for the evening. But all of these font sets are with your Perfect Embroidery Pro. You find those by clicking on your text design button. And here are the numerous font sets that you have available that you can bring into your screen. Okay? Wow. These are not, they, and it is a wow. There's, this screen is so full of images that are free. You have your font sets that are free. The way you would use those is you bring them onto your screen, and you then need to go get them. They are not mapped to your keyboard, so you would go get the individual ones that you need. Uh, for example, if I went to finish off my grandson's name, Leo, you can get those um, and position them as you'd want. Once again, I would cert certainly use my guidelines to help me line up the text as I brought it in. But you're going to bring those. All of these texts are available. So lots of very fun stuff in there. Um, are there any other questions that become available for us? No, we have answered pretty much all of them behind the scenes. Okie doke. Well, as everyone is um, leaving us for the evening, let me just put one other fun picture up on the screen, and I will thank everyone for joining me this